Welcome to Carpool Chats, a podcast brought to you by the Fuels Institute. Welcome everybody to Carpool Chats, and today I've got my good friend Kirk McCulloch with Grill Mark uh, on the line with us today. And good morning, Kirk. Good morning, Jeff. How are you? Good. Very good. Excellent. Um, Kirk. Kirk's gonna. We're gonna talk a little bit about a, a segment of industry of consumers that that oftentimes gets gets lost in the shuffle. And you know what uh, what's recently come out with this administration uh, through the the EJ forty proclamation or policy, however you want to look at it, is you know how how do we make sure that that we are we are getting the energy and the transportation and all the needs met for for rural or, or other communities that, that sometimes get missed in everything we do in regards to transportation and fuels. So, so Kirk, could you do us a favor and, and maybe introduce yourself, please? And then I'm really interested in, in the Grohlmark story and how, how, you, how Grohlmark started, because I think that, that says a lot. Uh, sure, Jeff. Thank you for having me on, by the way. But uh, I, my current role is Executive Director of Marketing and Business Development for our Energy Division. Um, so I'll get into that a little bit later uh, to whatever degree you want to hear about it. But uh, I'm a little bit of a geek on the Growmark system. So I, I always tell people I started my career with this organization in, in 1984 uh, in a, as Assistant Branch Manager in a two person branch. So just take that into perspective. But the, uh, that start, that beginning for me kind of introduced me to our, our organization at the, the grassroots level, so to speak. So I've uh, traveled a, ro- a lot throughout the organization throughout those year- these years, but I've been with the organization my whole career. So spanning that time and the history is important. So we started, our organization is 95 years old this year, I believe, if I do the math right. So we started uh, 1927. So the organization, really its roots, uh, even though we're an agricultural cooperative by nature, its roots are in the energy business. So we started with local producers as they started to, to bring on tractors uh, in the early uh, years of the 20th century. They couldn't get the majors to bring them petroleum products. And so they banded together. They formed local cooperatives uh, and pooled their resources, so to speak, so that they could get the supply that they needed. So that's the the humble origins of our organization that, that began uh, almost a century ago uh, to provide those needs for local farmers. Since that's the the basis of our organization today is it's expanded well beyond the farm market, especially on the energy side of the business. Uh, but our essence is still that, uh, helping our customers and members kind of succeed in their businesses. I, I think that's fascinating. And, and, and the role that Growmark plays, uh, you know, in the rural communities, we still talk about it today. We still talk about how are, you know, how uh, is our internet going far enough? Um, is, you know, what's, how are we getting power out to rural America, which makes up almost 20% of the population of the United States? Um, I only know that because I Googled it this morning. <laughs> um, you know, but, but that 20% is on 97% of the land in, in the United States. So, you know, it's, it's a part of, it's a part of the, the U.S. Mm-hmm. that can easily get overlooked by policymakers, by, by local state legislature. Um, and so, you know, what, what you're bringing, you know, to those communities is, is enormous. What are, what are some of, what are some of over the years, what are some of the tools that you've brought out to your co-ops and as far as fuels and, and energy and education, uh, well, I, I think that's a great point. And to your earlier point, Jeff, the other thing that gets lost is the productivity that comes from that portion of the population, whether it's in agriculture or construction or 
all the services that that rural communities provide and, and that organizations provide that uh, uh, are responsible for a lot of the livelihoods of people who may not even know that those jobs exist, <laughs> frankly. So in our members, right. particularly uh, not just on the energy side, but agronomy as well, um, we spend a lot of time and do a lot of supportive things for what we call the, the system, the Gromark system. So that that really, uh, Gromark is the wholesale element in this system, as we call it. The retail element, uh, and we are involved in retail, but the majority of that is indirectly through our member cooperatives. So they purchase their products from us and then they market, they, they uh, do the retail element of the business. But we have always, uh, Gromark has always played a role in that. So whether that's education, both product, technical, uh, business, every, everything that we can do to help them remain vital is an important way for us to go to market. So we've expanded that now across, uh, and I can speak, especially to the energy side of the business where I've spent the last few years of my career. Um, we've expanded that to uh, new members in new geographies. We've expanded it to our other non-member customers as well. So we take kind of the same mentality as an organization of, of being a teacher, a counselor, uh, doing everything we can to to help our customers be successful and that's that's kind of the way that we go to market it. so there's a lot of education in there there's a lot of services in there uh, gromark provides a number of overriding services to particular to our members the the ones that are the 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 centerpiece of of the origins of our of our organization fly the fs brand so if you're out in the country you see that fs little uh, rhombus on whether it's retail sites or uh, locations, that that's us. That's our system, and that's predominantly in Illinois, Iowa, Wisconsin, and Ontario, uh, which is where our, our historic beginnings were. But it's also extended now. Just uh, about a year ago, a little over a year ago, we uh, began playing the wholesale role for Southern States and its cooperatives. So we had a whole bunch of new members that take us all the way to the East Coast. Uh, both in energy and agronomy. So it's, uh, and we take the same mentality uh, with them. We're in our, our early stages of relationship, but it's kind of the way that we go, go to market. That's, it's, I just, I just love that, um, you know, because you we're in an industry or the transportation and fuels industry is so incredibly regulated. Uh, we have so many, you know, um, mm -hmm new fuels flying at us and and everybody is asking the same question right? everybody's asking what's next what what do we need to prepare for uh and of course with your roots in in the midwest in illinois you, know, you had a you had a first row seat mm -hmm. on the renewable fuel standard and on state tax incentives on biodiesel um and have 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 you seen a shift in acceptance of biofuels uh, over, I mean, is it, is it getting easier to have that conversation with the consumer or, or your co-op companies? I, I think it's gotten much easier, at least from my perspective. You also have to, rem to, uh, to remember that we're at, at our heart, we're a, an agriculture organization. So we're owned by farmers <laughs> at the end of the day. Um, our stockholders are our uh, member co-ops and their stockholders are local producers and customers, right? That are members of that co-op. So it's really easy for us. It, it's always resonated with us to support uh, the grain markets. So biodiesel and ethanol in particular from corn and soybeans is kind of really came natural to us. It didn't always resonate downstream to the end user. And uh, that's come, I think, a long way just as it's become more ubiquitous in the, in the, in the industry and in the marketplace where uh, ethanol in particular has just been, it's become part of gasoline in most places, right? So most of the consumers are just expecting that element in their fuel. And the whole E15 debate is kind of a separate issue, but it's just another way to introduce higher levels in my mind 
of alternative fuels into the marketplace. So we've, the industry's dealt with this uh, time and again over the years, bringing, introducing new elements into the market as fuel sources or alternative fuels. And so it, I've seen it generally adjust to that. Now, on the biodiesel side, I will tell you, uh, our volumes are much higher in areas that have strong incentives for the consumer to use that. For instance, Illinois has a sales tax exemption on blends right. higher than B10, right? So most of the blends, especially in the uh, warmer months, are B11 in the state of Illinois. So, so it it does, uh, the governmental, the regulatory issues obviously do impact where those those volumes are. But we're seeing, I think, greater acceptance and will continue to do so. And not just on those traditional alternatives, but a lot more conversation these days on uh, some of the coming alternatives that are getting a lot of press, the EVs and so forth. So. Yeah. And and Growmark has got um, so far as to walk the low carbon biofuels down this path, right? One of the concerns, whether it's warranted today or not, we still hear about fuel quality. We hear about engine operability. Mm -hmm. And you guys have gone forward with fuel additive packages to make sure that we are getting the best um, efficiency out of these engines and that, mm -hmm. and that they are, they're working well with the alternative fuels. So uh, any, any color you want to shed on the additive end of things? Well, to, it, it makes a lot of sense if you think about what we talked about earlier, about who we are and, and why we do some of those things. So we've been, we're a very science-based organization. Um, our sweet spot, as you might guess, is in heavy fuels and distillates and, and heavy-duty lubricants and so forth. So it's aimed at, at those, whether it's transportation, agriculture, uh, commercial construction, those types of marketplaces. Um, and so... It's always been, we, we have to get a lot better about it, but we've always looked at, from the additive perspective, we've, we've always looked at performance, uh, maintaining power and efficiency, and how do we get whatever the new engine technology is to perform at its optimal level. So we've been doing additives for that purpose for over 70 years. And so that's that gives us a little bit of, more of a comfort level with why we're doing it. But I think the important part for us is it's got to be based on the science. And there is specific needs of today's engine technology that requires certain elements in, in those additives. So we work really closely with developers um, and, and have a significant uh, percentage of our volume that is, is additized. We do gasoline additives as well, but, but that's important. You know, our, our niche is not, we, we have a lot of retail sites um, flying the fast operating about 230 of those across our footprint. I think, um, about half of those very rural, about half of those are unmanned locations that serve that local community or that local marketplace. Um, so even in those areas, those, those fuels will tend to, they'll tend to offer additized diesel, even in a retail situation. So we've always been very, very conscious of that. But it's really about driving what's best for that for that producer, for that customer. Almost, I won't say inadvertently, but one of the side effects of that is that we do improve emissions. So you both you improve fuel efficiency and you you improve emission quality. And so we've been we've been conscious of that for a long time. We've got a number of uses where we also incorporate uh, higher levels of biodiesel. So with the, with the uh, focus on how do we minimize the emissions um, coming out of that pipe. And so that's a very focal area that we're, we're trying to actually put more attention on. As you might guess, on the agronomy side of our business, as the carbon conversation gets more prevalent, uh, we have a lot of interest there. And we have a, uh, a relationship with a company called Indigo, where our role is really at the front end to help the producer figure out what their footprint is. Indigo has a global mechanism to, to, to uh, really actualize the, the market itself. So those two things are in a little bit of, a, of an infancy stage right now on the agronomy side of our business. On the energy side, we're also looking at that. We're also, we're trying to figure out, I, I would be 
not being uh, truthful if I said we got this figured out, but we're looking at how can we just being conscious of that conversation and of the importance for our organization to be sustainable, um, to manage nutrients well. That just that's just who we are on the agronomy side and the energy side. So from the energy perspective, we were uh, attempting to figure out how do we establish our own footprint better, uh, and what are the things that we're doing, and how can we help our customers do that same thing. So as they get opportunities that come to them that are asking them for their ESG strategy. Uh, we want to help them have one and, and we want to do a better job uh, as an organization of, of kind of facilitating that, that thinking, that conversation. Yeah. And I can't, I mean, just about every conversation we're having on sustainability these days. I mean, if you're really into the weeds, you're talking about carbon capture, mm -hmm. uh, soil, soil maintenance, um, additive maintenance and, and for, for, to be clear for, for some of the audience, the producer we're talking about is the farmer. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Sorry. That's our, that's our jargon. Thing. The, the, so. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but I mean, it's, it is an on point topic. I mean, we talk about it every day. And so what you're bringing, what Growmark is bringing to the table is, you know, all the way down to the, the farm field is that here are some, here are some best practices that one will reduce your costs, hopefully, mm -hmm. right? Because those additives are expensive, uh, you know, for for soil um, maintenance and in the crop. Um, but also, you're you're reducing the ultimate carbon intensity of the fuel should that corn or that bean go into biodiesel or ethanol. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. I mean, we are mapping that and out. Our organization has has the unique. Um, position, I think there's not too many that have, can really dig into both sides of that equation too. So from how do we yeah. optimize the performance of the equipment being used and also the practices uh, of production on, on that farm. And this, so the same thing that translates across essentially all of our, all of our customer bases, but we do have the unique position to both help agricultural producers minimize uh, their footprint, but also capture that carbon and, and sequester it. Um, and on the other end, operate as efficiently as possible so that they manage their own footprint I, as best they can. Yeah, I think Growmark is going to have a pivotal story or a very, a very important story. Because as you mentioned earlier, your your work is in the distillates. You're talking heavy duty off road vehicles which is something that doesn't get discussed hardly at all these days when it comes to CO2 emissions. We're talking about light duty and electrification, but we know the medium and heavy duty is going to be around for decades. Um, and even more so, you know, you know, how, how do we work? How do we work, you know, on the off-road egg sector? Because I mean, Cummins just came out with their new engine that can burn any type of fuel. And I haven't even read into the specs mm -hmm. on this thing yet, but I mean, the OEMs um, are, are finalizing some of their design work on trying to maximize the efficiency of these engines. Um, but they can only go so far, right? And then it comes down to what are we burning in those engines? And so that's a whole nother conversation that I'm sure we're going to have. Yeah. You know, as time goes on. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. And so we, you and I both and everybody who's in this business probably gets a lot of these questions all the time. I do encourage people to breathe um, the, the industry as it is today. We've got a long ways before we turn it over. But at the same time, we have to be conscious of and almost think from a, a standpoint of being BTU agnostic and, and just think about, okay, what are, what are the, what's the customer going to want or need from us? in the future as energy providers. And how can we start learning about that? How can we start engaging? Uh, agriculture producers are, they don't, that discussion doesn't get very loud in the public air very often, but they're very interested in these things. Um, alternative energy sources, just alternative technology. So it's something we talk about internally a lot and, uh, and probably we'll, we'll do more so. But we do have time to look at it as, okay, how do we get from point A to point Z, <laughs> and there's a yeah. few steps in between there. And our, our markets will be, uh, I think, around for a long time, but 
certain elements, certain alternatives are going to come into play. And so we just we want to be ready as an organization to to adjust to those and make sure we can provide what our our members and customers want from us. Well, I certainly think over the next couple of years we're going to be having this conversation. I mean, this is this is this is not just on the radar. This is the topic of choice in most industries. So. Um, Kirk, with that, we're, we're, we're out of time. I really appreciate you taking the time uh, to join us today. And I look forward to uh, many, many more conversations on this topic. Oh, it's my pleasure, Jeff. Thank you for having me.